Welcome to New Life Christian Ministry. So glad that you are here joining us this morning. I'm thankful for your, your presence and your obedience to be here as well. Sarah, can you come here for a minute, please? This is Sarah Miller. She is headed to uh, Jesus School in Orlando, Florida. So um, we just bless you uh, as your church family. We love you. And we support you. And uh, of course, we prayed for you on yesterday. Many wonderful blessings were prayed upon you. But I have a favor to ask of you. So you've been such a wonderful, uh, delightful servant of God. Just the way that you worship, the way that you live your life here. And before you leave, this is your last Sunday for a while. Would you pray a blessing over this ministry? Would you do that for us? of the Lord in the land of the living, Father, and that wherever they go, Father, I thank you for anointing their eyes like Elijah to see you. I thank you for anointing their ears to hear you, that you're not a respecter of persons, but as they come in, as they 
Come in that they will taste and see and that they will leave even more on fire and they will go into their families, they will go into the streets, they will go wherever you send them, Lord, that they will walk with you and talk with you and they will reflect their Father, Lord. May they not settle for lesser loves, God. May you ignite a fresh love in all of us tonight, Lord. Ignite us, Lord, wreck us. May we not send all. Jesus, you alone are worthy. May we not take you for granted. May we not grow comfortable with you. You're holy, you're righteous, you're beautiful. We honor you, Lord. We thank you for resting here in this place right now. Jesus. Church, let's pronounce this blessing over Sarah together. Can you say this with me? Sarah, Sarah. you are the Lord's good ground. Go, be fruitful, and multiply. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Sarah is going to need our support, so would you please get with her after church and ask her how you can support her while she is gone in school. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a holy moment. What a holy moment. We're going to continue in our series called Rooted in Truth, but before we begin, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the opportunity to hear from heaven today. We declare, God, that you are the source of life, you're the source of truth, and you are definitely the only way. Open our ears so we may hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to the church today, God. Pull out all the deception that is growing in our heart, Lord. 
We want to be rooted in truth only, God. Every, every root that grows outside of Jesus Christ that is living in us, that is producing fruit that is not holy, not righteous, not pleasing in your sight, God, would you reveal it to us? Be the revealer of truth today, Holy Spirit, as we go back to hear the foundation of truth. The foundation of truth, Lord, is you, Father God. We love you. I ask for your anointing to be upon me and the hearers so that they might become doers. May this word be faith-filled, but not a faith that leads to nothingness, but a faith that leads to works. For your word says that faith without works is dead. I pray, God, now in Jesus' name that every religious system that lives inside of us, every doctrine of men that lives inside of us that is not rooted in truth will be broken now in the name of Jesus Christ. Every planting of of the enemy in our lives, God. Every planning of the enemy that brings forth fruit, God, is, that is not of you, we ask that it would be canceled out today by light and truth. Cleanse us with your light. Wash us with your blood. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We're continuing the series again called Rooted in Truth. The way that this series was born, I was asking God, God, the people, where are they? How come we're not all walking in purpose as we should? And he said, it's because they are broken. And by being broken, what he's saying is that they don't truly reflect the full image of Jesus Christ in their lives. There's some things that are not true that they're believing. There's some fruit that is not of me that they are producing. And so we've learned that there are some events that have happened to us in our life. Uh, some things that the enemy has planted that we still believe. We're still having the effects of it. If you catch yourself depressed, if you catch yourself angry, worried, all these things that God has not given us, then there's a seed growing in us from somewhere. Some erroneous thought has happened. So we're asking God to root our whole lives in truth so that we might inherit the kingdom of God. Church, can you say the kingdom of God? Nothing on this earth is worth missing the kingdom of God. And the only thing that can shift us away from his kingdom after we have obtained it is to be deceived and desire the things of this world more than the things of God. Rooted in truth. And today's message is entitled, Growing Where God Plants Us. It's so important to grow only where God has planted you. In the beginning, God placed us in his goodness, but through deception came death and displacement. We must be replanted in truth to obtain life in Christ. Again, in the beginning, God placed us in his goodness. Where did he place us? In his goodness. I'm talking about Adam and Eve. That from the very beginning, we were placed in his goodness. But through deception came death and and displacement. We must be replanted in truth to obtain life in Christ. Father, be with us today as we go into truth that we might have life. Let's go to Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The first thing we must establish if we're going to be rooted in truth uh, or allow God to plant us in truth and grow then where we're planted, we must determine in our minds that, that God is a God of truth. That truth comes from God alone. That you are not by yourself carriers of truth unless God told you the truth. We don't know the truth without knowing God. So first thing we need to determine today is, is God truthful? Does God tell the truth? Is the truth, uh, is the source of truth God? We're in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and it says this. This letter is from Paul a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence. Church, can you say confidence? This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. So what is this saying here? That number one, that God is the God of all truth, 
And he sends messengers to build the faith of his chosen ones. So that's exactly who I am. I am a messenger of God, not because I called myself. I would have never asked for this job, right? I didn't call myself. God called me. And my, my, my job is to present the truth to you so that your faith may grow, okay? Number two, in order to live a godly life, we must know the truth, all right? And the truth is Jesus Christ, relationship with Jesus Christ. So from the beginning, uh, as, we were part, as Adam was a partaker of the tree of, of, the, of the knowledge of good and evil, we know the difference, the difference between good and evil, but without knowing Jesus, we don't know truth. We truly don't know uh, his goodness. The next thing we must know about this passage is when you know and live by the truth, you are gifted with God's promise of eternal life. So it's not enough to just know the truth. You've got to live the truth out as well. And that way, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And the final thing, uh, the God of truth. We know this about God. God does not and cannot lie. I think we need to testify to that. Can you say this with me? God does not and cannot lie. So this Bible is truth. Jesus is truth. And we must live by the truth. And there are no exclusions uh, to the truth. He doesn't change his word for anyone. Okay? God is the truth. He does not lie. Numbers 23, 19 says this. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human. So he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? So what do we see here? Since God doesn't lie, it's foolish not to respond in obedience. It is absolute foolishness to disobey the Bible. It is absolute foolishness to disobey God because he does not lie. If he says that the wages of sin is death, guess what the wages of sin are? Death. And it doesn't matter who has done it, right? He does not change his word for anyone. And we even know this, that his word doesn't change for men or even angels. Even the angels were evicted from heaven for going against God and his truth. So we must realize that if we align ourselves or align our lives against the truth of God, he's not going to change for us. When God speaks, it's our job to obey. In the very beginning, God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. Okay. So when God speaks, it must happen. So everything that, that leaves the mouth of God is either life for those that obey or death for those who disobey. No exclusions at all. So my kids, even though they are a pastor's children, they still have to get in line with God's truth. There is nothing that I can do for them. Uh, to, to make them choose to obey the truth. I can give them the truth, but it's up to them to obey. You are God's children. I am one of God's messengers. I can give you the truth, but it's up to you whether you obey it or not. And it breaks my heart uh, when I don't obey. It should break your heart when you do not obey. The truth is the truth. It will stand forever. Let's go to Genesis now. I'm sorry. Yes, Genesis now. We're going to talk about how God rooted us from the very beginning in truth. Church, can you say truth? Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that truth would become evident to everyone in here that is listening or listening or watching online. That you are the truth. You are the only holder of truth. I pray now in the name of Jesus Christ against deception in all of us. Is there any deception growing in any of us, God? Is there any wild seeds, God, that is growing in us that you did not plant? 
for you have planted us in truth alone. Are we believing a lie? Because lie is a cancerous substance to the soul. Lies will kill us and destroy us. Lies are the planting of the enemy. The devil is the father of lies. Every time he speaks, he's lying or perverting the truth. Have we believed any of the enemy's lies and are they leading to death in our lives? Holy Spirit, illuminate the truth in us in Jesus' name. We desperately need your help. We don't want to be lost. We don't want to think we're on our way to heaven. We don't want to think we're obeying truth and we are really not. So search our hearts, oh Lord, and if there is no, if there is untruth in us, begin to remove it. Illuminate the lies we believe in Jesus' name. Amen. We are now going to Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. God roots in truth. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man. Church, can you say, and there there. he placed the man. So when God places you in truth, that's where you're supposed to grow. Wherever God puts you, that's where you should grow, okay? And that's where life is. Let's keep going here. The Lord planted the garden in the east. There he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So Adam and Eve were surrounded by God's things and everything he made was good. Church, say this with me, Lord. Surround me with your things. See, I didn't say surround you with good things. Surround me with your things. Because if God plants you somewhere and puts you somewhere, he's going to surround you with good things because everything that is of God is good. But everything we call good is not good. I I hope you get this. Let's start doing some digging. Let's get some lies out of us because there's some things that we call good that are not good at all. If God didn't put it there, it's not good. So sometimes we were persuaded by people. Sometimes we were persuaded by the own lust in our lives and we called something good that was not God. And that is inviting death and sickness and bondage into our life. God's desire is that we would be fruitful, that we would enjoy his love, that we would have life through obedience. But man messes up by calling something good or seeing something as good that God said was bad. That is not good. So that is deception. Let's keep going. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Question for you, church. Can God lie? He cannot lie. So if he says something, that thing has to happen. So he told them, if you eat of that tree, you are sure to die. So what do we learn here in this passage? That when God speaks, it's the truth alone. Please get this. Please get this. Not when your wife speaks. Not when your boss speaks. Not when you speak. But when, not when politicians speak. That should be an easy one. All right. But when God speaks. Speaks, it is the truth alone. So if God said it, that's my truth. That's what I live by. I don't care what the economy is saying. I don't care what the doctor is saying. I don't care what anybody else in the world is saying because only if it left God's lips is it true. Only if he said it is there life in there. And I'm going to believe what he said rather than what I feel. If you go by your feelings, you're going to mess up every single time because you have rejected the tree of life and went back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you're going to determine for yourself 
what's good and what's bad. Do not do that. You will be deceived every time. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't deadly until there was a law given. The law introduced an opportunity for sin, and sin always brings death. When we choose to sin against God, the payment is death. But if we obey the truth, we will live. So God said that if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. So this is the first law there was. And we know very soon we'll see that they broke that law. But there was a way that, uh, that seemed right that led them to death. But I have, to, I have to share some good news for a moment because you might feel like this message is getting heavy. And the truth is heavy because the truth don't care about your feelings. Do you hear what I'm saying? Culture cares about your feelings. The truth doesn't care about your feelings. Do you understand what I'm saying? The truth is just true, right? So uh, if I say that, you know what, I think I can survive a fall off a skyscraper. I I think I can do it. That's not true. And pretty soon if I jumped, the truth doesn't care about my feelings. Gravity doesn't care about my feelings. The truth will soon be found when I reach the bottom of the ground. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the truth must be obeyed at all times. But listen, if we sin, 1 John 2, 1 through 6 says this, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only for our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Church, can you say true? So maybe this is where some of our brokenness comes into place because we don't fully believe the truth. And the truth is written right here. And we can be sure that we know him if. So we can say that we know him all that we want. But the truth really reveals those that really know him. Church, can you say the truth? The truth is this, that if we know him, it means that we obey his commandments. That's how... You can stand before the judgment seat of Christ and he say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. What is a worker of iniquity? It is one that lives a sinful lifestyle. It is one who does not obey his commandments and he goes on to say, I never knew you. Well, man, I didn't know that. Yes, you did. The truth was revealed to you. I said this. And we can be sure that we know him. Church, can you say if? If If we obey his commandments. So if you're obeying his commandments right now, you know Jesus. But if you're not obeying his commandments, you don't know Jesus. All right. Verse four. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the what? Truth. Truth. Come on, truth. Give give God praise for truth. We need truth to live, okay? But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. That's the truth right there. That's how you know if you're a Christian. That's how you know if you're headed to heaven. It's the truth is right here. This is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. There's your definition of a Christian. One who lives their life as Jesus did. Well, how are we going to do that? He shared his spirit with us. He gifted us the Holy Spirit. So, Praise God again for truth. Come on. We need truth to live, okay? God roots us in truth. However, the devil roots us in lies. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray again 
that every lie that the enemy has planted in our mind and we receive it as truth that is bringing forth evil fruit in our lives, God, would you begin to illuminate it so that we can be replanted in what you said? If we believe what the devil said, we've believed a lie, we've been deceived, and we're producing death. But if we believe what God has said, we will be uh, those gifted with life and life more abundantly. Search our hearts in this moment, O oh God. May we recognize those seeds that the devil planted in our minds that we are believing and is causing us disobedience. Every time we disbelieve what God has said and believe what the devil has said, it produces sin in our lives. Help us to know these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Genesis now, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Again, the devil roots in lies. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. Church, can you say she knew the truth? truth. Was that the truth? Okay. She knew the truth. All right. God said, okay, how did she know the truth? The next two words, right? God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Verse four, here comes the lie. No, no, actually, yeah, here comes the lie. You won't die, the servant replied to the woman. So there's the lie. God knows, so he's introducing some some more truth. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Did God tell us that we were made in his image and likeness? Is that the truth? Yes. So Adam and Eve were already like God. Amen? So now the, the devil is trying to introduce them to sin. The the, the devil is trying to uh, have them for himself, all right? The children of God are those who obey the spirit of God. The children of the enemy are those who obey him and produce the unrighteousness that is in him, all right? God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. Let's stop right there. Pray this prayer with me. Lord, Lord, if there are any lies that I am convinced are truth, I repent. Deliver me from the lie. In Jesus' name, amen. The woman was convinced. She saw Okay, so she's forgetting what she heard. She's forgetting what she heard, and now she's going on to what she can see. This is where we get in trouble. This is where our brokenness comes from. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and then she wanted the wisdom. So the first was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and here's the pride of life. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit, and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. That's exactly what we try to do when we sin against God, but we don't repent. We don't make it right with God. We try to fix it ourselves, and we cover it with stuff, all right? So say this with me. I I, I hope you're brave enough to say this with me, church. Say this with me. Lord, Lord, uncover me me. 
Come on now. There's some lies that we've believed. There's some wrong things that we do, and we try to cover it up. Oh, well, that's just the way I am. Or, oh, uh, the Lord understands my heart. Oh, my goodness. Stop. We must stop covering up our sin ourselves. We must stop saying, uh, uh, I'm okay with it. God's okay with it. His grace is okay with it. No, uh, grace is for the repentant. Did you hear what I'm saying? Uh, I hope you catch that right there. Grace is for the repentant. Those that say, God, I'm sorry. It's against you and you alone. I have sinned. Grace is not for those who hide from the face of God because they are in sin. Let's keep going. Verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. When the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Verse 11, God says this to them, who told you that you were naked? Like, that's something that you should not know. So who told you that, right? And church, I believe that all of us in here have to begin to ask questions to God uh, or allow him to ask questions to us and say, who told you that? You see, some of you believe that you are no good. Some of you believe that you're not wise. Some of you believe that you won't live as long as your mom or dad lived. Some of you believe that you must uh, always live on a certain side of town. Some of you believe that you always have to live check to check. Some of you believe that, you know what, I don't know if my kids will ever come to the Lord or not. Some of you believe that your past uh, dismisses you from God gloriously using you in his kingdom. And what we should say, what we, would, which, which, what we should desire to hear God say is, who told you that? Who told you that? Hallelujah. I didn't make you that way. That's not what I told you, so why are you believing that? Why are you believing that you're no good? Why do you believe that you're a failure as a father or you you can't hold a good job? Why do you believe that just because the job says you need these credentials that I can't bless you anyway? Who told you that? Who told you that? We're believing some lies, and God wants to know who told you that, all right? Let's keep going. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? So listen to me. We're still guilty of eating from that tree sometimes because we use our knowledge of good and evil and say, you know what? This isn't good for me. You know what? God says, yes, it is. I want you to have it. But the knowledge from the tree says, nope, this isn't good for me. I I, I can't afford it, God. It it, it doesn't calculate. It it doesn't work out, God. Uh, I I can't go to them and ask for forgiveness, God. It's not going to work. They're going to laugh at me. Who told you that? We must stop eating from the wrong tree. Still today, we have a hunger for that wrong, that wrong tree. Because why? Because the Bible says that within men is a way that seems right. But in the end, there are the ways of death. Verse 12, the man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And she said, the truth. The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Church, say this with me. Lord, Lord, have I been deceived? deceived. Man, come on, church. This is where our freedom is. This is where our freedom is in, in this question. Lord, have I been deceived in any way that I think? You are all this for me, and it's the truth. But I've been deceived into thinking that this is all I'm worth. This is how I see myself way down here, and I can't have all that. I know your word says it, but that's for the good Christians. That's not for me. Who told you that? Who told you that no one would would want to marry you because uh, you're a single woman and you've got children now, and the devil has planted that in your mind that no good man's going to want you because you've got babies? Who told you that? The deceiver. It's time to begin to evaluate the way that you think in your mind and say, God, am I believing the truth or have I been deceived? Come on. 
This is the brokenness that God is talking about. This is why we can't go forward and inherit the promised land and do all the things God is calling us to do because we've been deceived. We don't see ourselves the way that God does. And he's asking us to ask him that question, have I been deceived? All right, so what happens then if we sin? What happens if we uh, move ourselves from truth? So God planted Adam and Eve in truth, in goodness, surrounded by life and blessings. But then they disobeyed God. So they had to be uprooted because God does not lie. Church, say this with me. God does not lie. So if we go against God's word and do something, he's got to carry out what he said he would do. We're in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Then the man... Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. So now he's covering them, right? And we know that the animals that he, uh, that, that, that he uh, made for them would have had to die to give up their skin, okay? He, it didn't say fur because fur does not require blood. Skin requires blood. All right. So he covered them with blood, with the blood. Something had to die. A sacrifice had to be made for them. And this would point to the the way that Jesus would save us later from our sins. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden and sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. So if you want to get locked out of your blessings, if you want to get removed from the goodness of God, then go ahead and start disobeying the truth. And you'll see what happens. So listen, I am, I'm a blessed man right now because I'm an obedient man. So it's not, it's not my education because I'm a college dropout, right? I didn't have an inheritance, all right? My, my dad came from the south side of Lima. My mom came from the east side of Cleveland, all right? Uh, beans don't burn in the kitchen, fish don't burn in all that stuff, all right? So I didn't have a silver spoon. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, right? So the only way that Damien Tibbs got to where he is in life right now is through obedience to the truth. I'm living a blessed life because I'm obeying God. But listen to me. If I stop tomorrow, if I stop obeying God tomorrow, the blessings would just begin to vanish. They would begin to vanish because this, my life is the fruit of obedience. Some people's lives are the fruit of disobedience. So if you want to be uprooted from the blessings of God, start disobeying him. Start living a life of sin and you will see distance grow, not between you and God, because he'll never leave you and forsake you. But what you will see is distance between you and the goodness that he tried to plant you in. I tried to bless you. I told you how to be blessed. I told you where life was. I told you if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I told you these things. But you decided that you wanted to begin to live a sinful lifestyle. And because I am God and cannot lie, I've got to stay committed to my word. Because when we swear, we have to swear to things around us. I swear to this, I swear to that. But when God swore, he had to swear to himself because there's none greater than him. Do we understand? I don't think we want to play this game against God where we say, "Um, I won't surely die. Church, don't play that game. I I won't surely die. Or my, my blessings won't de- decrease. Like, he, 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 he favors me. He favors us because we're obedient children. He favors us because we are in his will. He loves us all, but he favors those who will obey him. So don't find yourselves uprooted from the goodness of God. Because if you do, you will find yourself in a slumber. And you will need to be awakened to the truth. Let's go to Luke chapter 15. God bless you. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 
through 32. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. How many sons did he have? The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. Church, can you say uprooted? And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Do you see how his lifestyle changed once he moved from the place that God had put him? He was blessed. But he said, you know what? I want to do some things on my own now, right? And he, and he walked away from the goodness of his father's house. About that time, his money ran out. A great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. So my question to you, church, is why wouldn't this younger son have just sent a telegram home requesting more money from his rich father? The reason he didn't do that is because he knew he uprooted himself and he was now living wrong. For instance, when I, uh, when I moved out of my father's house and went to Ohio Northern University and decided that partying was better than the basketball scholarship that they offered me, and I dropped out of college and I began living a crazy lifestyle, uh, there was times I was real hungry. But I could not pick up that phone and call my dad. Why? Because he knew that I was living wrong. That's a hard phone call to make, isn't it? Come on, you've been kids before. You knew when you weren't living right and things were going wrong and you're like, oh man, I know they have it, but I messed up, right? Listen to me. The key back to the favor of the Father is to uproot yourself out of the wrong that you've done and through repentance say, I messed up. I really messed up, and I want to come home. This is exactly what we find this young man doing. In verse 15, 16, rather, the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Did you, did you hear that? He uprooted himself from the goodness of his father's house where he lacked for nothing. He uprooted himself into sinful life, a lifestyle, and now... He couldn't even get a job at a pig farm without persuading the owner. And now no man would give him anything because he uprooted himself from the, from the father's house. All right. Verse 17. Here's what we're praying for. When he finally came to his senses. Church, can you say awakened? Awaken. He was finally awakened. The, the King James Version says he came to himself. He said to himself, at home, okay, church, can you say truth? truth. Okay, so I, I, pray, I pray to God that if you're living a lie, that you would hit a wall and it would make you say, uh-uh, this, this isn't it. Yes. This isn't it. Like, sin is good uh, or, or fun or pleasuresome for a season, but uh-uh, this isn't it. Church, can you say, this isn't it? I pray that you don't keep pushing and pushing and pushing against that wall of sin. And when the Lord is saying, turn around, repent and come home, because do you know what happens if you push and push and push against that wall of sin for too long? It's going to collapse and you're going to fall over into death. Life is this way. Death is this way. May we all be delivered and awaken to our sinful lifestyles or sinful fruit before it is too late. Let's continue. The truth came out in verse 18. 
So I pray that we all get to a point that if we're believing any lies and there's any evil fruit being produced in our lives that is not godly, if we are living a lifestyle or thinking in ways that the Christ mind inside of us does not produce, that we would come to ourselves by the spirit of truth. Holy Spirit, my prayer now in the name of Jesus Christ, your assignment is to be the spirit of truth. Your assignment is to lead us and guide us into all truth. Would you show us by your power, O oh Lord, the lies that we are believing, the deception that has put us to sleep so that we might be rescued from the grasp of sin and death. Free us from deception. In Jesus' name, amen. The truth came out in his pain. The truth came out in his brokenness. May all of our brokenness lead to repentance and not bondage. May our brokenness lead us to repentance and not bondage. Here's where the truth came out. When he came to himself, this is what he said. When he was broken, when he was full of lust and sin, he said, Daddy, give me all of my money. I can't wait for you to die. Give it to me now. But when the truth uh, rose up in him, he changed his tune. Because listen to me, he had a heart change. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So God had to break his heart. He had to make it so that nobody would feed him or give him anything anymore so that that heart would break. Listen to me. Don't you try to get yourself out of the Lord's punishment and the Lord's pain until that moment where you break and you get your heart changed. Say this with me. Lord, change my heart for good. So when the heart changes, the words change. And listen to what he said. I will go home. (laughs) Woo! That's enough right there, right? I left. The the wrong thing I did was leave. The right thing I'm going to do, I'm going back home. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 22, we're going to skip down a little bit. I'm sorry. Let's just keep going. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. Uh, Church, can you say this with me? The The truth is still filled with love and compassion. So, so don't fear the truth, just obey the truth. Because when you obey the truth, you have to know this about the sender of truth, the God of truth, that he is still filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But we know that the the father did not receive those words. So what do we learn here? The son didn't desire to live in the house his father provided anymore and immediately began living in sin. It was only the threat of death that brought him back to his senses. And he began to reflect on the goodness of his father's house. This is what led him to go back to his father's house. All right. A couple more passages, and then we're on our way. We need to know the way back to the Father's house, all right? This is how we become released from our brokenness and released from bondage. We have to know the way back to the Father's house. Let's go to John chapter 14. We've got six short verses here, and it says this. Let, your, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, If it were not so, I would not have told you. I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, church, can you repeat after me? I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. So we know the way. His name is Jesus. The way you get back to the Father's house is Jesus. And there's something else that you have to recognize about the Father's house. You are the Father's house now. You are where his spirit lives. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 say this, summing this all up. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Today's message was entitled, Growing Where God Plants Us. So everybody that was born from a woman is born into sin and through Adam we receive death. But everybody that is born again into Christ uh, because and they receive him as the way and as the truth and as the life, they will never die. They will not be lost. They will be born again. Okay? But there is an if that God gives, up, gives us. If we know him, we will obey his commandments. So if you ever want to do a litmus test on your relationship with Jesus, on how well you know him, it will all boil down to this. How well do you obey him? Your obedience to Christ is directly tied to your relationship with Christ. That's why religion won't get you in, only relationship will. All right, we're going to close here in a moment. We've got one more passage for you. Born in sin and reborn in truth. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. This is the truth. Maybe it's the first time some of you have heard it. Maybe it's the 100th time some of you have heard it. And maybe it's the final time some of you will hear it. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Who did he go to speak to? Jesus is the way, remember? The truth and the life. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So Nicodemus knew some of the truth, but he didn't know all of the truth. And if you don't know all of the truth, that's a very dangerous position to be in. Because if you don't know all of the truth, you can't obey Jesus who is the truth and he's the one that says that if you love me you will obey my commandments and how can we know Jesus then if we don't know his commandments and how will we ever be with him forever if we refuse to obey them coming to this building doesn't mean you know Jesus. Singing worship songs doesn't mean you know Jesus. Standing in the pulpit and being the pastor doesn't mean you know Jesus. The only way a person really knows Jesus is he's known by Jesus. How are you known by Jesus? Because Jesus knows those who obey him and those who don't. Well, how do we know? Because at the end, the goats will go on this side and the sheep will go on this side. Who are the goats? The disobedient ones. The ones who eat, the ones who rejected Jesus Christ as Savior. You might say, I never rejected him as Savior. I never said that out of my mouth. I believe that he is the Savior. But did you obey him? The sheep are the obedient ones. They are the ones to which he said, My sheep know my voice, and the stranger they will not follow. Who are you following? Church, please look up. Who are you following today? Don't follow what's right in your own heart because that's exactly what the devil did to Eve. She was deceived into thinking that something that was deadly was good for her. Let's keep going here. Jesus replied, I assure you, this is the true talking. 
I, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, okay, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Praise God. Verse 7, so don't be surprised when I say, here's the truth, you must be born again. The, the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you hear the wind but can't, can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be born again? And here's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Have I ever really been born again? How do you answer that question? How do I know that I've been born again? What is the actual evidence that I have been born again? It's that this, I am no longer a slave to sin. The power of sin has been broken in my life. There might be times I might desire to sin, but I never have to sin again. Why? Because I have been made one with Jesus Christ through faith. I have been made one with Jesus Christ. The old me has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer, this is how you know you're born again, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Do we not understand how much power we have to obey? So he didn't just say obey and give no power. He said obey and hear. I'm going to step inside of you. I'm going to make you a whole new creation. I'm going to give you the truth and I'm going to give you the, my spirit so that you might obey me. Don't be deceived. Don't let somebody hurt you to the point where you begin to lose your identity in Christ. Don't ever have desires that are so strong that you want to step away from home and say, I want this more than I want you. Father, I pray for your mercy right now in Jesus' name. Have mercy upon us all. For your word says that if any of us say that we are without sin, that we are liars. So God, our problem is not with sin. Our problem is with a lack of repentance. Our problem is with making fig leaves and hiding our sin. Our problem is thinking that when we sin, that it's not against you. Would you help us today, God? Would you help us to be rooted in truth? Church, can you stand, please? I want you to ask the Holy Spirit this question. Holy Spirit, where am I? Am I planted in truth and righteousness? Have I seen and tasted of Jesus? And am I remaining in fellowship and relationship with him by being obedient to his word? Do I love him more than I love myself? Have I willingly laid down my life for Jesus? Because here's the great danger. If you ever pick your life up again after you've given it to Jesus, you're only capable of sinning. But if you will die to yourself and say, Jesus, I give my life to you, his righteousness fills you. His power fills you. And you produce the fruit of the Spirit. You are no longer in shame. You are no longer in bondage. So, Lord, I pray now in Jesus' name that you would sever the fruit that is not of you and sever it by the root, God. Can you all lift your hands all over the building right now, please?
you don't know how blessed you are to be alive right now. There are some people that have slipped away already and they weren't right with God when they died. But how blessed are you right now? You're alive. You still get a decision. You still get to choose Jesus right now. Do you know how blessed you are to hear the truth? Father, I pray against every deception, God, that they're believing right now. And I pray, God, that they would receive the truth. Jesus, the truth. Jesus, the way. Jesus, the life. We can't do it without you, Jesus. And God, some of us have picked wrong fruit and we're holding it even now. And we're eating it every day without repenting. And even though you love us, you still have to give us what we asked for. If we say, I want sin, then you say, then you choose death. But if you say, I want righteousness, if we say, I want righteousness, then you say, then you choose Christ. Jesus is the way, the only way. You can put your arms down now. In these next few moments, would you begin to repent of all sin? Would you say, okay, Lord, here's the sins I know about. I know about these, but God, there might be some sin I'm producing just because of some untruth I believed. Some of you come out of some churches where they didn't teach you the truth. And we got to deal with that fruit. Some of you come out of some household where you were told some untruths and now you're living that fruit. You don't think you're beautiful. You don't think you're smart. All these things that God says that you are, you're not believing that because someone planted some lies in you. So that's got to come out. Do you know what the Bible calls sin? One of the things it calls sin? Everything that is not of faith is sin. So what is of faith? Everything that God said. Say this with me, church. Father, help me believe everything you said. Then I know that by faith, I will be free in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, listen to me. It's, it's, it's a special kind of 